Peace, love, and light, family. Welcome to another Read Book Club discussion. I am your host, your sister, Dr. Ma'ad. I have with me my partner, Brother Everett Winchester. How are you doing tonight, brother? I'm powerful and feeling great, my sister. I'm just blessed to be here. Wonderful, wonderful. You just had a, an, an event in Baltimore about two Saturdays ago. Could you briefly tell us about that event and what your upcoming events will be? Um, wonderful, yes. We had a Unity Ceasefire event at the TNET Center off of Hoffa Road in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, small event, but it was very nice. We had some African drummers, um, had some people speaking about you know self-destruction and stopping the violence. Your son actually made a powerful presentation. I'm gonna give you that video in a few about Thank what you. unity about what unity means. And um, we also had some black vendors out there selling products. We had uh, divas on call. This lady, she does uh, grows her own um, grows her own vegetables and stuff like that, and she creates powerful, healthy meals. And we had a brother, Messiah Fitz, selling um, black owned pie company. So it was very powerful. And um, next we have a Juneteenth event. So hopefully people in the Baltimore, DC area, or Delaware, Philly, if you can come through, um, we're gonna have our uh, fireworks at the end, black vendors. Um, so just come out, support black owned and um, be a part of a powerful event. I've, and and we and and I you know I heard that the event at uh at TNAC was fire. Uh, my son came back. You know he gave me a full report, brother Evan. Uh oh, uh oh. You know, and he said he said it was beautiful. You know, awesome. um, I don't know if he told you or shared this with you, but he has the UNIA symbol tattooed on his left arm. What? And uh, yeah, never even I, told me that. Yes, and so he's a huge fan of just the the organization. Um, and their ideology yeah. and the things that the UNIA accomplished, you know, over the years. And a lot of people think that the UNIA doesn't exist anymore. And I tell exactly. folks, you know, the UNIA is still very active, you yes. know, um, in the community. And you bring in, you brought the chapter uh, to Baltimore. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I remember you reached out and you told me, I said, brother, brother Everett, I don't no. know if I want to commit just yet, because uh, when I, when I commit to something, you gotta you be know, all I, in. I, I gotta be all in and you I'm not going to, I'm not going to commit and then kind of half do it and not be, you know, when I go in, I want to want to go in right. all the way. And right. so, but I am looking to join, um, the UNIA chapter here in Baltimore. And I'm just looking forward to, uh, seeing and, and being a part of, of the different things that you're doing. Uh, we're definitely going to be at the Juneteenth um, festival. I know that there is yes. another one going on in Delaware. Okay. And so we were thinking about shooting up there. And then I said, ah, no, it's Baltimore, Delaware. I said, we got to go with the home team. Right. So, right. so awesome. we're definitely, we'll definitely be uh, with you on Juneteenth. So family, family, as you are coming in, share the show tonight. The read book club will be discussing chapter four of birth of a white nation, the invention of white people and the relevance and it's relevance today by Dr. Jacqueline Badalore. Family, we're in chapter four. Brother Everett, can you believe it? Like, it, it feels like it kind of, it, it flew. You know, right. reading this book, it, it flew. But this book, family, as you can see, it's a thin book. It's not a lot of, it's only about 108 pages. But it's a, it's packed with a lot of information. You know, it, it reminds me sort of, and I don't mean to get biblical. You all know I grew up in a church, <laughs> but in the Bible, you know, they had the book of James, which is like five chapters, but in the book you learned, you know, you learned a lot of things, you know, right. in the book of James. And so that's what this reminds me of. But it also reminds me of like uh, Dr. Naeem Akbar's books, um, you know, Breaking the Chains of Psychological mm -hmm. Slavery. That book was only 68 pages, but the amount of information in it was, was tremendous. And so family tonight, uh, we're going to be discussing chapter four of Birth of a White Nation. Even if you don't have the book and haven't read the chapter, still listen to the discussion because you're going to learn a lot. I know I learned a lot in, in chapter four. So so in chapter four, and let me let me turn to it. We're on page 68, 69. Mm -hmm. Chapter four, contingent whites and in-between people. Mexicans and Irish in the U.S. So, Brother Everett, I want you to spark it off, King. Tell me, what were your thoughts about, you know, the first couple of pages, you know, in this in this chapter? Um, just the knowledge and information that maybe I was naive, but I was just ignorant to the fact of this information of how they used to call Irish like they consider Irish like poor black people and look down on them. And the whole thing about, you know, how Mexicans 
were considered white, how that came about, um, which is really powerful. Learning about the um, the war, and you probably can educate me and fix, help me out, Dr. Mott. The war what was it between the Mexicans and the uh, um, and the, um, the, uh, the, the colonies. Mexi- Yep, the Mexican American War that took right. place. Mm-hmm. And how you know um that that uh how uh they lost, but because they wanted the land and everything, they kind of created this term to allow them to be considered white, and then they stripped them of the power, you know. That's crazy, isn't it? But, but is it I'm glad you mentioned that because brother Everett, when I read that part in the chapter that okay, they went to war with the Mexicans. They they took their land. I think it's mm-hmm. like the northern part. I have to go back and look. It says they had to cede one third. Mexico had was forced to cede one third of its territory, the northern part to the United States for a sum of 15 million dollars. So basically they were bullied into selling their land for 15 mil. It mm-hmm. says this vast expanse of land includes what are now the states of California, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, mm-hmm. Utah in Texas and part of Colorado and encompass some 100,000 Mexican citizens, including a variety a variety of native tribes, such as the Navajo, Apache, I'm probably butchering all of these, Navajo or Navajo, Apache, Pueblo, and Comanche. I probably butchered those names, family. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, like you said, and I'm glad that you said it, and that's why I got excited. They made this treaty with them, right? So after they right. took the land, gave them some money, oh, we'll make you whites, we'll include you, you know, we'll allow you to, to naturalize into our, you know, to assimilate it. And then they took it back from them. But mm-hmm. isn't that, and I don't mean to be nasty when I say this, but isn't that how they operate typically? That's it's, it. like, it's like with no honor. So you sit down, you all came to an agreement, and they held up their end of the bargain. Right. They held up their end of the bargain. And then there was just no honor. You know, it's never any honor with them, you know. And and, and I remember and shout out to brother um, Asar Emotep. He talked about how you can determine the character of a race by just looking at their history, you know, and just you, mm-hmm. the, the, the character of them. And so it seems like that has always been their character. Right. To just not be honorable, you know not be honorable. So anyway, like you said, brother Everett, they give them the land, they come to this agreement and then they, they took it back. So we're going to make you whites or we're going to declare that you're white through the treaty of what is it called? Uh, Guadalupe, uh, how, how Hildago, uh, Guadalupe, Mm -hmm. the treaty of how, how, uh, the treaty of Guadalupe Hildago. And so they said, we'll make you whites based on, you know, this treaty, but brother Everett, could you explain to the people, how did they take it back from them? Well, again, which makes this so powerful, um, the book so powerful, they start talking about the laws. You know, it always goes back to the law. So the treaty was like, if you're Mexican and you're like, save me Mexico, you can keep your land. You can keep all of that. And then they're like, OK, you know, we just laws or whatever the case may be. And the next thing you know, the Mexicans don't have the land. Everything kept being changed. They would they would instill something or, or change something. And they use that law, that that book, and that you know the law of the, of the land to just change everything at the drop of a dime. I can only imagine being a Mexican, thinking you own land and you can do this and do that, and then the next thing you know, they like, no, you, you you don't own it. We you 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 don't you're not entitled to this. I think one of the major laws that they changed was that you can inherit the land from your ancestors. So if I was Mexican and my dad had the land, I would get it. And then they naturally said, no, that's not in effect anymore. So yes. now how do you do land, that? How do the you land do that? that I'm, right. The land that I'm living on that my father gave me that you said I can have all of a sudden you just take it from me. Now I don't have any land. I don't have anywhere to go. My family's in shambles. Crazy. And that's like you say, uh, the way they use the law is still kind of how they use the law now. And it's just it's just shocking. This book is powerful. It's just powerful how they go about it. Yes. And like you said, I mean, how do you do that? How do you land that's been in someone's family, you know, for generations? You just take it and say, you know, no, nah, we're changing this. This is right. This is this is not what we're going to do. And I, exactly. you know, and so and, and it was I mean, I mean, that was that was very eye opening for me. And immediately, of course, you know, me being, you know, an African in America, I started thinking about our ancestors and all of the land that they took from us. Yes. So, you know, I, you know I, I know my heart goes out to the Native Americans or whatever, but 
I started thinking about us like, damn, they did us the same way. You know, they took exactly. that's exactly. what they did to our ancestors, you know, stripped them of, of, of their land, you know, and even more and even more than that, if we, if, mm -hmm. we really, if we really get into it. But then I noticed, too, that um, again, she mentioned in this particular chapter that with the Mexicans, I think she says and you could correct me if I'm wrong, but. Remember, they created a law that said that if you were black, you know, you couldn't testi testify against white people. Yes. And then, you know, they did it for the Chinese. And I'm learning that it also was applied to the Mexicans, you know, that they couldn't, you know, they couldn't testi testify against against white folks. And even yeah. going and even going back to the land, I just want to circle back to that. Um, they said that some of the Mexicans, you know, would have their daughters marry white men just so that they yes. could keep, the, keep land. the land. Isn't that, isn't that bananas? That's crazy. That, 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 that shocked me out too, that you're going to sit here and be like, they, they were training their daughters and being like, this is what you're going to have to do so we can obtain land in America and keep us stuck. Marry a white person is just like, I, I can't imagine myself telling my daughter that for the perseverance of land. That's, that's, that's deep and powerful in its own right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And he, she talked about how when the Mexicans started coming over, um, how they, um, well, became, you know, I guess a part of the United States, that they began to get blamed for all of the labor problems, mm -hmm. you know, the labor issues. And, and I love on page 75 where she says, you know, this is a pattern that we've seen before. She said, focus upon focus upon a not white or in this case, a not fully white group as the cause of labor problems rather than the social structures that condition the problems and the capitalists who control the conditions and the wages of labor. Mm -hmm. So the Mexicans were always the fall guy, but that's what white folks do. They always come up with the fall guy, you know, like the Mexicans get blamed for things, black people, we get blamed from things, you know, they never blame, you know, the structure or the system. It's always you know, a minority group that is, yes. you know, blamed for Wait, the you different problems. Do you have a man? Oh, I, I don't know what that was, Mister. Mister. Look, look, brother Everett. I don't know what that was, but um, it seems like you know, there's always like a a a, a fall group, and it's always you know some sort of minority. Let me unmute you now. There's always <laughs> some, you know, some minority group that gets blamed for the 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 problems, you know, and in particular, like the labor problems, even with crime, you know, in America, they're blaming on black folks, you know, it's the, it's a crime problem and it's the black people. So they always blame other minority groups for the different issues uh, that exist instead of us looking at the system that creates these issues. Mm -hmm. Right. And so what do you, you know, what do you want to say to that? Yeah, brother Everett? I, mm -hmm. I think you, you, you hit it on it when you were talking about the wages, they talk a lot about that. And you mentioned something that was very powerful how they blamed the Mexicans for the, a lot of the issues. And that stumbles all the way back to how they deal with black people. If you think about it, they're always blaming us for the job issues. You know, they talk, start talking about it. They were blaming us. I think she mentioned that. How, you know, it fell onto black people, how we would get blamed for maybe lower jobs and, and you know, the jobs availability and things of that nature. You know, saying that there was a couple of free black slaves and stuff like that. I mean, free black people that were getting free. Um, so it's just powerful in its own right how she just breaks down everything. It just always brings it back to the laws. But also, they pointed out the wages a lot. She really talks, like, like you said, about the wages and how, you know, they would change the laws again to dictate who would get paid what. Um by your by your by your ethnic uh, ethnicity, you know what I'm saying. If you're Mexican, you'll be able to. I think she mentioned it might have been on 75 mm -hmm. that they would have have a couple of dollars to maintain themselves or whatever the case may be. So I don't want to go too far when they start talking about the Irish, but that is very important about the wages and how they're starting to pay, you know, pay free people because as black people are starting to be free or run away or be free up in the north a little bit, those challenges. Um, you know, those challenges make them identify black people as the problem why their wages are low. And if we can be above them, we'll be all right. I just we'll started to, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just put mm -hmm. them down low. Make sure that they're lower than us and we'll be okay. Yeah. And let me just circle back one more time to the land grants. I'm on page 73, where she says that the American legal system became an instrument by which Mexicans lost their land and were displaced. 
And it says the U.S. land owning system is based upon legal title. In this system, land is individually owned and can be subdivided and sold without regard to heirs. It says the Mexican system, which you were talking about earlier, Brother Everett, you know, you said it's rooted in tradition and considered patrimony, residing ownership within family ties, not individuals. Right. But it says, in addition, it included communal land grants that provided rights of use, such as for grazing or farming. These later or latter grants were, were not recognized under U.S. laws and the lands were simply taken and sold to white uh, speculators or yeah, speculators and, uh, and businessmen. But you know what I thought about there, Brother Everett? I mm-hmm. thought about the Berlin Conference. Remember how Africa was divided up amongst different Europeans? The right. British took this part. The French took this part. And, and, you know, and somebody else took this part right at the Berlin, you know, I think it was called it the race for Africa or something like that. Yeah. But it was but it was at the Berlin conference in the 1800s where they split up Africa amongst European people. And so that's what they've always had a history of doing, going somewhere, taking someone's land, you, you know, and then creating a bunch of laws on somebody else's land, telling them what you can do and what you what you can't do, you know. Right, and so I, right. I just wanted to kind of mention that, that I also thought about that as as well. Um, moving forward, she says that, um, you know, again, that the that the the marriage between Mexican women mm-hmm. and, and white men, it served the economic interest of white men at the end of the day. That's what yeah. it did. You know, um, white men, you know, they were able to get a hold of land. And then she even said it was like vagabond white men. Like right. these weren't even white males that had anything going on. Right. These were like the look, you know, the the poor white trash, you know, right. that these Mexican women were marrying, you know, and 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 you know, in order to hold on to their land. But it says that a researcher says, according to Horse Bell, it was largely Mexican daughters of well-off families who married good-looking but lazy vagabond Americas, Americans. Mm whose object of marriage seems to have been to get rich without having to work. Many of these women were brought to ruin as a result of marrying those white men. And so mm-hmm. I just kind of wanted to, to point that out. These weren't even, you know, these were poor white trash men yeah. that the, that the, that the Mexican women were, were marrying. And not to, right. and to piggyback off of that page 73. I, one thing I did want to not want to say Dr. My eye is that I had highlighted was, that um, she did mention that, you know, these Mexicans were supposed to be free and everything, but it started with them being lynched as well. You know what I mean? They were lynching them, um, most executed by mobs. So, you know, it, it's just being free just wasn't enough. You know what I mean? They were going to find a way, if it wasn't by law, it was going to be by a lynch mob to um, get rid of these people and take over. So it wasn't just just the laws, you know, that they, that they used. They still use that... that um, inhumane lynching and, and disrespect. So it's that that pattern just wasn't with us, but it was with us to a, a whole nother level of extreme. Don't get me Ab- wrong. Yeah, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but, but just the fact that you're supposed to be considered white and have your land and just to, to go about that, it was crazy. You know what I mean? Do the trick. Why even do the trick? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I think you're breaking up some family in the chat. Could you let me know if is it is it me or is brother ever breaking up a little bit? I think he okay. would just break it up a little bit on me. I'm not sure, but so, someone okay. in the chat will let me know. It may, it may be my system. Sometimes, you okay. know, pe- people might sound like they're breaking up on my end, and it's because my internet speed is, is uh, my internet connection is weak. But um, I love how on page 77, she talks about uh, T.S. Marshall's three components of citizen citizenship rights, civil, political, and social. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and she said, okay, she's looking at the Mexican experience in the U.S., and she was saying that, you know, they didn't have, you know, civil, political, civil. Yeah, someone said his brother Everett. Yeah, it's <laughs> so they said they didn't have civil, political and social um, um, rights, you know, um, that their civil, political and social rights were violated, just like our civil, political and social rights were um, violated. And she mentions at the bottom of 77 that social rights of citizenship are required for you to even exercise civil and political rights. Mm. So um, I love that she talked about that. And she talked about that in previous chapters of well. So she said that she ends uh, the section with saying full inclusion in the new Republic, in this new America required being viewed as white. So when these immigrants came over here, 
and not even yeah, it was immigrants that came over here and the ones that were already here, like the Mexicans, they took their land. If they wanted to be included in this new republic that they that you call America, you had to be viewed as white. And then she begins the discussion on the Irish, where she talked about the things that they did in order to be viewed as white. So she says when the Irish folks first came over here, they, like you said, brother, ever, ever earlier, they were viewed as white Negroes. Yeah. Was it them or the Mexicans? I think, I think it, it was them. That was them. I, in fact, let me look at what they were called while you're talking, because they were considered... Um, White Negroes. Were, yeah, that, that was white Negroes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was called white Negroes. Yeah, white. Yeah, they were, and they were treated. You know, they they worked side by side with black folks. Um, they lived in the same areas and, and and were subject to the same conditions as black folks when they came over here. But something changed. And brother Every, could you break that down? Something changed. And what was that? So well, when they first mm -hmm, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Mayer. I cut you off. I heard. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was just that I was finished with my question. I was just going to reiterate it that when they first came over, they were okay with working with white folks. Um, I'm sorry, working with black folks and living around black folks. They were even engaged in in sexual relations with black folks. But but mm -hmm. could you explain to the people, Brother Everett, what changed? Well, um, it was a lot changed, actually, but once you start and the, and I and um Correct me if I miss, miss a little bit where you're going at, but what I got from a lot of the initial things that change is that power and one in class and not wanting to be low, not wanting to be considered, you know, low like us. And if 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 we're at the bottom, if I can get a little over them, I can get more resources. I can get the better jobs. I can get the better things of that nature. So it seemed like they started to separate. Plus, white America started, and she always mentions this, they always were reminding that about that um, Bacon's Rebellion. So how can we, you know, make sure that they don't unify and things of that nature? But I wanted to ask you, Dr. Ma'at, that's why I went blank while you were speaking. If she mm -hmm. was talking about the Whig Party, um, could you educate a little bit? Because I never heard of the Whig Party till this I never, I've never, I never heard. I never, I never, heard, never heard about heard it. So you yes, never heard I, of it either? I never heard of the Whig Party. Um, all I know from, from the books, from reading the book, is that you know this was some sort of political party that eventually was transformed into the Republican Party, right. you know, and I and I love in this particular section entitled "Political Landscape" how she gave like an overview of uh, the history of political parties. I tell my mother mm -hmm. all the time. I say, "Mom, you know the Democratic Party, you know, black folks used to be a part of the Republican Party, you know, back in like you know when Lincoln when during the time that that Lincoln was you know president." the vast majority of the of black folks were Republicans. And it wasn't mm -hmm. until the New Deal that Franklin Roosevelt, he offered the New Deal. Remember, he was he was running as the poor people's president. And so he presented this New Deal and then black folks began converting to to Democrats. But what I love in this book, Brother Everett, is how she gives us a short history, you yes. know, a short overview of um you know, the American political parties and, and how they were robbery, how they were robberies right after they signed, you know, the Constitution and how at one point, you know, you know, those robberies started with the Federalists and the Republicans. And then, you know, the Federalists began dwindling after or fading after the War of 1812. And so then the Republicans, you know, for an, an entire decade, um, they dominated, you know, the political mm -hmm. scene. And then and then later on, you know, you had uh, Jackson. It says uh, Andrew. It says uh, blah, 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 against the last. Blah, blah, blah. So you had Quincy Adam, Quincy John Quincy Adams uh, was running up against Adam Jackson and the Jacksonians. All the people who supported Jackson, um, they became the Democratic Party, which was created by Martin Van Buren. But yeah. she also talks about how the Democrat, the Democrats ruled, I mean, from 1828 to 1860. And she talked about what they did, how they maintained their their power. And she said one of the things they did was they appealed to immigrant laborers of the north, including the Irish, in part because the party rejected Navitism, nav nav which mm -hmm. is basically a strong opposition to, you know, foreigners. But but one thing that I thought was. I don't know. I, I, it was just it, it came to me. I said, well, wait a minute. This is what they still do. Right. It says that she says here, the Democratic Party appealed to immigrant laborers. This yeah. is what they still do. Mm -hmm. Whenever you hear Biden, Kamala, 
even even Barack Obama, any of those Democratic people talk. They, oh, we got to do something at the borders. We got to help the immigrants. They appeal to the immigrants, you know, and they still do that. She, she also talks about how she also talks about how they um, and I have it written down. I'm looking for it right here, but I, I, I can't find my notes. But in here, she also you can correct me if I'm wrong, Brother Everett. She mentioned how they they exploited the victimization of Irish people. So yes. they they said, "Come on, you know, we're your friends. We know you. We know you're victims. You're victims of of bad, you know, bad wages, unfair wages." And so they exploited that, just like they do black people today. They know that we are victims of racism. So what they say, "Come on over here. We're your friend. Yeah. Vote for us." And so they exploit us. And I just I just thought that it was very. I don't want to say intriguing, but it was very alarming just to see the same thing. They, they, they've been doing this thing. This is how they've been operating for, you know, over a century now. They appeal to immigrants. And then if you're a victim of something, you know, and they'll they'll exploit that that whole situation. So we're all victims of all for the vote. All for they the don't, vote. They don't care about no black about black people being targets of racism. Biden went in office and now I'm getting ready to get off. Biden went in office. He's been in office. Right. He signed executive orders for the LBGTQ, so so orders that will protect transgenders, LBGT people. He hasn't signed one executive order to protect African American people. Not one. He even signed, they even just passed a law for anti-Asian hate and all of that. We haven't had one executive order signed. In fact, you know that Biden cursed out our civil rights leaders in a meeting that went viral on YouTube. Laid no, the, I didn't hear. Lay, no, he laid, laid the civil rights leaders out when they asked him to pass an executive order that protects black people in America. You know, in America, he laid our people out. Biden got on there. I had you can get family if you don't believe me, go to YouTube, type in Joe Biden civil rights leaders leaked meeting or something like that. He laid them out. He said, I'm not going to do this. I'm not. He telling all of them what he's going to do and what he ain't going to do for black people. And then so. And, but you know what, Brother Everett? I blame us because yeah. you had folks who, who were on. I'm talking about on social media, you know, in our families. We're like, look, we got it. We can't just simply go out here and vote for Biden. We need to demand something from him. We need to create an agenda and we need to hold his feet to the fire before we give him our vote. But you know what the other black folks said? Oh, I just want to get Trump out of office. I wanted to get I want to get Trump out of office. And so everyone was so concerned with getting Trump out of office that they made no demands. They didn't give Biden any demands. They didn't say, well, look, if you want the black vote, vote man, this is what you have to do for us. And we don't do that. We don't treat voting like a uh, what does Dr. Claude Anderson call it? Quid pro, we, quid, quid pro quo. Uh, quid pro quo. Quid, quid, pro quo. quid pro quo. We don't treat it like that. We just give people our votes and say here. And then right. later on, we say, can you do something for me? No, 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 family. What we're supposed to do is create an agenda, present that agenda to those different candidates. And whoever bites on the agenda, then that's the candidate that we support. But black right. folks were so busy following behind white folks. And Brother Everett, you know, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. You know, we follow behind white folks as much as black folks say that they don't like and see I'm losing folks folks dropping off down it's not the black my eye talking about black folks following <laughs> white people but that's what we do white people kept saying we just want them out we just want them out so then you started hearing black people say we just want Trump out we just want Trump out you know and 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 it made him basically the scapegoat goat the scapegoat of racism but here it is you put Kamala and Biden in office Biden's not signing anything and doing anything on behalf of you and then Kamala the one that people's running around saying she's the first black president all this bull crap she got on an interview with good morning america she did an interview with good morning america a week ago and said america's not a racist country oh my goodness this that's is what kamala same. said and, and and like you said quid pro quo that means you get something in return for your vote for people that that, that don't know that's a, it's, a, it's a political term so if you vote for me in return for you voting for me i'm supposed to address your needs and give you something back that's politics. So we don't address that. And she was, I believe she said, I'm not going to do anything specifically for black people. I'll do something to change the laws that will affect all of America. Well, um, then why am I voting for you? Because I need something that specifically affect our community, me right. personally, my family, the people I live around, black businesses. 
you need to do something specifically for us because we're down and we want to catch up with everybody else. That's very important. So when we vote, and I, I stress this to everybody, queer pro quo, your local government, whoever, don't just vote just because you we you voting for a brother. That brother has to come back and say, I'm going to do something for my community, your community, the people that voted for me. And we don't do that. White people expect that in return. The Jewish community, when they go and put their vote in, they know you better come back and represent our community. And we got to stand strong on our pride and start taking the hits and say, when I vote for you, I demand something in return or you can't get our vote. And once we start doing that, I think a lot of our issues will change. Well, not a lot, but we'll start making more political power. But right now we're not demanding anything. They're using us and our emotions for our vote. I'm glad you said that. That was that was and that's something she's like when she's talking about this in the book. I never thought she would even bring this up. I never thought that this would come up. Now I'm learning that it was a wig party and things of that nature. Just just pure powerful. I see you got a little emotional. Did the, the, the book the book's that powerful to you? Because you when when I when you got on, you was like, you ready? And I was like, yeah. This chat, there was this book is more powerful than I ever imagined. I'm not gonna lie. I'm glad. Yeah, you same mentioned. here. No, same here. Same here. And brother, on, I'm on page 81. Okay. Um, at towards the bottom, I'm in the the middle paragraph where she, after she says that the Democratic Party appealed to immigrant laborers, she goes into. She starts talking about, she says, I have a start right here. The Democratic Party also offered something all American for the Irish to utilize and claim white supremacy, white unity promulgated by the Democratic Party helped to silence questions about the qualifications of the Irish for citizenship because their allegiance to the party asserted the Irish as white. So that was one of the ways that they became yes, considered political. white. They aligned themselves with the Democratic Party and they refused to work side by side with black folks. They said, I need to separate myself from black so folks. So I can grow up. So yep. I can grow up. Exactly. So I can come up. And that's why Dr. John Henry Clark says we have no friends. What Black folks kill me when they want to be happy. Oh, you see that everybody came out whites and, and Hispanics and everybody came out to the protest. Dr. John Henry Clark said. We don't have any friends. And you clearly see with the Irish that when they got an opportunity, so when they first came here, they were right there with us. They were they were laboring with us. They were, you know, living in the same communities with us, same conditions with us. But when they saw an opportunity to come up, they said, OK, no, we're going to have to separate ourselves from these Negroes and we're going to have to grow. And, and so that was one thing that was interesting. But another thing, she said the Democratic Party promoted white unity. They always mm -hmm. promoted white unity. And I don't think, brother Everett, that that changed so much. I mean, you no, know, I'm not saying no. that they go out here and promote, but they still maintain white supremacy. They're not doing anything to dismantle it. That's why they never pass laws. You know, even when even when Barack was in office, you know, and you had Trayvon Martin who was murdered and different people being murdered during his administration, they never passed laws um, that 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 um, that classified these murders as hate crimes, just like Biden, you know, didn't hasn't passed or hasn't signed an executive order to classify these murders. Right. These public lynchings, you know, or these 2021 lynchings or 21st century lynchings as hate crimes. And so the underlying ideology of the Democratic Party of both parties is still white supremacy. Dr. Yeah. Amos Wilson tells us in Blueprint for Black Power that both of these parties are two wings on the same plane. So I yes. tell folks, you, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat. They want to maintain white supremacy and they'll use a mixed mulatto face like Barack Obama to sell it to sell it to you to maintain it. They'll put Kamala, who's Asian and something else, whatever she is. They'll put these people in office, but you got to remember these are mulatto or mixed faces still on a white power structure. And that structure is in place to maintain white supremacy. Brother Everett, do you want to add to that, brother? You was flowing, my sisters, powerful. What they do is no matter what problems happen in this country, no matter how much they beef, they put their race first. And the UNIACL, we always say race first. We got to start and our family is our race. Our, we are all family. So we got to start putting ourselves first. We got, and that these are the philosophies of Marcus Garvey. You know, we got to start putting ourselves first so we can be at the table with them. We can't be bargaining with them while they got all the power and right. we have nothing. And we sitting up here like, yes, we we're gonna do for each other. They're not doing for each other. They're giving you a little bit of the plate. 
and they got the whole dinner table. You know what I'm saying? And we only getting a little bit. So we got to start putting ourselves ourselves first, man. And so, yeah, you was just flowing, my sister. You was flowing. Yeah, well, we do. We got to. You said it right, brother Everett. We got to think race first. And one thing that I don't like is when folks think that because you you think of your race first that you hate other people. And I, I had to bring um Baba Emotep, you know, shout out to PLM. But Baba Emotep came on this platform where we had a discussion about what does race first look like? What is that concept? What, what are the principles? You know, what should be the guiding principles of putting our race first? But a lot of people will think that, oh, just because you are a race first person or has a race, a race first mentality that you hate other people right, or you right, don't like no. other people. No, it's not about that. Like you said, it's about putting our needs and wants and our interests before other people. Other groups of people move like that. Right. Other they, groups they, of people move like that. They, they put do. their needs and their desires and their interests first. And you got black folks sitting around here just trying to unite with, oh, the Hispanic brother, this is our brother, this is my brother, this is my friend. No, we need to be thinking, like you said, brother uh, Everett, as race first, race yes. first people. Yes. It's like um, I, I, somebody was telling me, they said, brother, you're a little extreme. I'm like, wait a minute. If I tell another black brother not to kill another black brother, that's race first. If I say go and support your black owned businesses and build businesses that are and put black owned businesses in the black community so we can see more than entrepreneurs that are drug dealers, that's called race first. So we got to be race first. We got to put ourselves forward. No one else is. Stop reaching out for a handout and let's put each other first. That's not that's not that's not, you know, being a racist. That's being proactive and succeeding and trying to survive. And yes, you know, if people feel offended by that, I don't know why they don't. They feel like, and I, you know, I don't want, want to get into the religion part of it, but sometimes I think the Christian Christianity part of it, of loving each other and, you know, loving your oppressor and things of that nature. And this is just my opinion, but I think that has a lot to do with it instead of saying, man, you know, like Malcolm said, um, the we sick thing, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I'm not trying to be cool with the mass. I'm trying to run away from here. You talking about we sick because you in the house. You know, until we change that mentality, it is. What isn't it, it is. isn't it, isn't that crazy, brother Everett? That the same, you know, plantation personalities, you know, the same personalities that existed on the plantation exist right here in 2021. You got you got folks like us, the Maroons. We the rebels. We like we need to be doing this. We running away from the hills. We trying to separate. Then you got the black folks that's like, what? I ain't going nowhere. This, I'm an American. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm I love it right here. I got I'm making six figures. I had a, a buddy I got into an argument over this. I make six figures and I live in a house. I live better than and I said, brother, 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 brother. You know, he he considered himself a high value man. And I said, brother, in America, in this so-called land, in this land that we call America, no black person is high valued. You don't have any power. You don't control any resources. You don't own and control any institutions. So you think you have value because you make six figures? Miss me with that. Miss me with people posting about Jay-Z becoming a billionaire or Kanye West becoming a billionaire. Miss me with that. Because at the end of the day, even though they are bosses, they still have bosses. Yeah. Don't think that they don't. Right. They don't think. Look at Jay-Z. Sure. Jay-Z and Beyonce. Beyonce had to release Black is King. Where? Who's who distributed to who distributed Black is King? Disney. Was it Disney? Yeah. Disney. So you would say, well, wait a minute. You and your husband are worth over a billion dollars. Surely you can distribute your own products, right? Because at the end of the day, her musical is a product. You still can't, you still don't even distribute your own product. You still going to Disney. Look at Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry, even though he's, I think he's either worth a billion now. And I think, I think I did see something about him being worth a billion or close mm -hmm. to it. Even with the nice studio that he has down in Atlanta, Georgia, Tyler Perry still has to go to a network, BT, which is yep. no longer black owned and operated to distribute yep. his product. So with all of the money, you know, that they have, you know, with all of the money, look who is still in control of distributing their products. Yeah. And you know what, um, Dr. Ma on 82, I wanted to say this before I forget when they, and, and for a lot of people that, you know, may not know how low the Irish was compared to black people when they talking about uh, why they preferred the Irish over the blacks, it says, while Irish workers were employed on the docks, 
the niggas are worth too much to be risked here. If the patties are knocked overboard or get their backs broke, nobody's losing anything. So they had no regard or they, they, they you know, their value wasn't even as much as blacks because we was like how free labor. You know what I'm saying? We were kind of property. So they really didn't really have any value for them. Um, they got the low paying jobs or they was pretty much considered just like us, but free blacks and worth anything. So, again, and when you ask that question, I, I wanted you to go into the wig and that political party, because that's how they changed. That's how they moved up. They attached to political parties to get what to get any um, better beneficial treatment over black people so they wouldn't be the lower class, at least not as low as us. And it's just crazy. That makes you sick in the stomach. I wonder how many white Irish today that are racist know how they how they were thought and how they were treated back then. You know, it may, it may, maybe that they, they would have a different outlook. Probably not, but maybe. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, I mean, you're right. And that's what they did. They aligned themselves with political political party, which was the Democrats, says on page 83 that they started voting as a yeah. block, which is and then that's sad because black people don't even do that anymore. Remember, back in the day, we voted as a block. Now you got some black folks, and even though majority of black people still do vote Democrat, but we did used to vote in blocks. Everyone knew, okay, we're going to vote for this person. But now you right. have black folks like, well, I don't know. I want to, you know, I want to vote Republican, or I want to do this, or I want to do that. And so, our biggest issue, brother Everett, is is the disunity and the disorganization. Yeah. You know, we're not going to get anywhere um, while we are um, while we are, you know, separated. And, and unorganized. We're not going right. to get anywhere. So we need to unify. We need to unify and we need to um, organize. Yeah. That's what we need to do. Unify and organize and create political, uh, create our own damn political party. Even if the candidate, you know, our political candidate ain't going to make it. But at least, you know, start with a party and then shop our votes. Get, you know, it's 48 million black people in America. Let's start our own party and shop our votes. Go to these different candidates. So we'll have our candidate, of course. And if our candidate has a, a you know, can make it, then we'll back that candidate. But if not, we go to the different candidates and we say, look, we got 40 million votes right here. This is what we want, you know, to happen. Not only do we have 48 million votes, we also have a check. You know, we have a check right here. and We're going to support your campaign, you know, with 100 million dollars or 200 million dollars, you know, and that's just black folks, you know, 100 million maybe. You know, and, and here you go, you know, and, and this is what we need you to pass. You know, those are the conversations we need instead of the hoping and the begging, like you said, Brother Everett, you know, begging for a seat at the table. So anyway, right. so anyway, moving to the last section of the call to abolition, it said that in 1841, 60,000 Irish addressed, um, they, they put out an address. It says they issued an address in 1841. Uh, to North America to join with the abolitionists and oppose slavery. And as soon as they did that, you had out other Irish people coming out the woodworks saying, no, 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 no. We don't oppose slavery. Well, I'm not. A, they said, I'm not a fan of it. But, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's an institution that was here before we were here. So we don't want to mm -hmm. get involved. And that, again, goes back to what Dr. John Henry Clark has been saying, has said for many years that black people don't have any friends. Do you want to add to that, Brother Everett? No, you had mentioned it earlier. You was flown, but like this is the part where they say we can't look at upon the blacks as their brethren, brethren. And um, mm. you know, it just seems like throughout history, as you see it, that um all the way, I guess, to the days of Kemet, how they they stole from us, used us, and took took from us at the same time, and even in this country, how you know, we unite with, with fellow people that are on the same level as us. And they say, man, we're going to go ahead and, you know, try to be a part of this whiteness because um, we're going to advance ourselves. Not only do they move forward, they just they start torturing us as well and kicking us while we're down. You know, it's it's tough. You know, it makes you feel proud to be black because of how 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 strong we are. But like you, you was flowing. You need to give yourself the DJ horn for that the way you was flowing. <laughs> Because um, unity is a must right now. We don't have time to be out here fighting with each other or calling each other out or having division. We just got to be about the work of unification and uplifting our people. And if we can do that, we'll, we'll be OK. But right now, like you say, we can't be up here trying to, you know, be with the enemy 
and they and, and thinking that we're going to get a lot out of it when we can't even get together ourselves. We're not going anywhere. We're just pretty much fulfilling their needs of getting their agenda across, but no black agenda whatsoever. No black agenda whatsoever. I want to end the discussion with another concept that she mentioned in this chapter, manifest destiny. And she says that manifest destiny is a religious doctrine with Puritan roots that holds that the U.S. reflects the chosen people predestined for salvation. And so that whole idea, you know, of manifest destiny, you know, the destiny to overspread the whole North American continent with an immersed an immense, I'm sorry, democratic population in that white America would spread demo democracy and freedom to lesser people in the process. And so it really reminded me of uh, the Portuguese when they came into West Africa and how they came, you know, with their with their um, with their Catholicism and they wanted to convert. You know, they kept saying we wanted they wanted to Christianize or at that time, you know, they were Catholics, but they we wanted to convert us, you know, to them, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I'm I'm coming here to save you. Right. That whole idea. This is manifest destiny. You know, I'm going to come and save you. This is my purpose to come take possession of your land and, and convert you. And how they did that, you know, with the Portuguese. And then you find, you know, the uh, you know, them doing the same thing really here in America with with the Native Americans, that whole idea of manifest destiny. I'm going to spread democracy like what? Like, who the hell are you to go to another country, right, and tell people that they need to be democratic, right? I mean, I'm just saying, like, right. who the hell are you, you know, who, so who the hell are you to go to another person's country and say, you need to be, we want to, you need to be a, a Democrat or you need to be Christian. But this is what white folks do. This mm -hmm. is what they have been doing yes. um, for so, for so long, for so long. Yeah, democracy and freedom. And then mm -hmm. when you look at the U.S., you're saying, well, hold on, wait a minute, look how you all treat you know, the so-called black people over there, you running over here telling us, you know, how to how, how to conduct ourselves, you know, how to conduct our government, how to govern our people. But look at all the issues that you have. So what are you, what are your thoughts, Brother Everett, on, on Manifest Destiny as we wrap up? Um, powerful. Just that last part, right as she closed the chapter, she says the experience of Mexicans in the U.S., after the Mexican-American War and that of Irish Catholics reveals not only the value that being white had to come to represent but the struggle to control the determination of those who were really white. We see through these groups that Mexicans were excluded from whiteness at the local level despite federal law and that Irish were included through the exercise of white supremacy at the local level by the virtue of political allegiance. It's just the, the, the whole the whole chapter was just deep. You know what I'm saying? For her to just end it like that and becoming really white was fought out in the muddy waters of labor competition between and among laborers. So it's just crazy. It's just crazy. And we're still going through it today, you know, just trying to get a job, um, putting black, white and whatever you are on your application. You know what I'm saying? It, it's still there. We just don't think about it as much. But but you didn't answer my question, brother. Ever, I said, what are your oh, yeah. thoughts on on manifest oh, yeah. destiny? The idea of you know how white folks were going around, they wanted to spread Christianity. Now it's mm -hmm. I, instead of Christianity, now it's democracy and freedom. So they had this whole idea of manifest destiny, manifest destiny. So I was right. asking you about that. What are your oh, thoughts okay, on okay. that? Yeah. yeah, I did hear that. My bad. I was just you know I wanted to get that point across. Okay, well, no um, you know. My point is, and I don't want to offend anybody, but, uh, you know, we just got to really do our research and study, um, have to learn our history, learn ourselves, and then we'll find out that their agenda and what they're pushing across really isn't for us. That religious part of it, like you say, now going into the, you know, the, the, the pol political part of it and things of that nature, um, what's going to benefit Black people as a unit, as us collectively? And then we can look at it. Don't tell me to join into what you're doing or what you're preaching, because at the end of the day, again, they say race first. Everything involved with them is to keep them controlling resources. You know what I'm saying? Dr. Claude Anderson, you know, and, and we, we did Powernomics together. And I, that's when I read Powernomics on, on the first book club. Um, he talks about race and race is actually a race, not in terms of colors, but like a track race, a race for economic political power, resources, and that's how they move. And anything that they approach us with is going to be 
involved in that. And like Dr. Claude Anderson says, if this was a track meet, we'd be on the bench. We wouldn't even be on the track right now. You know, we're not even in, we're not even competing in the race. He says, so instead of thinking of it as, as a color, think of it as our people trying to compete for economic resources, political power. How can we have political power when we're trying to join their, their feel good agenda, so to speak? Like you say, it started with the, you know, the religion part of it, the feel good thing. And now it's going into, we feel you, we, we, we understand your, your needs, come join a democratic party, what have you. And it's kind of hard to comment on it because I'm, I'm a, of the, the level of, like you say, the research tells you that's not, that hasn't worked for us. It hasn't, it hasn't at yeah, all. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It hasn't at all. All right, so family, join Brother Everett and I back here, same time next Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to discuss our last chapter of the book, uh, Birth of a White Nation. All right, the next chapter is Seeing White and Naming Injustice. And I saw when I actually went through it, I saw she has pictures of, of different lynchings um, that occurred, you know, yeah. in the history of America. So seeing white and naming Injustice mm. is uh, chapter five, and then she has an afterward. Um, so I want to knock both of those out if we can. Let's chapter five, and yeah, chapter five in the afterward, which is why would whites want to dismantle whiteness? And and I think that I, this is just me personally, uh, Miss B uh, Brother Every. I think that they don't want to dismantle it because they benefit from it. Why? Why you know, would you? Why, why would, would you? you? Why would you want to dismantle a system that you benefit from? So, you know, that's that's what I think that she's going to argue. But who knows? Right. All right, family. And also get your Read Book Club T-shirts. Get your Read Book Club T-shirts from Hockey Customs on Instagram. Let me drop Hockey Customs uh, name in the chat. So I'm going to put it on the screen as well. Yep, that is his logo. Yes. Hockey Customs. All right. So he's on Instagram. And if you don't have an Instagram, you can email Brother Haki at his email address. I'll post this. I think it's at gmail.com. Yeah, this is his email address, guys. This is his email address, family. All right, so get your Read Book Club t-shirts. We'll see you here, uh, same place, same time next week. Peace, love, and light.